Um, and, but anyone that reads uh, the, the chronicles of, of Indian mathematics, you, you soon realize, you know, there's no need for any mythologizing because the story is so extraordinary. Uh, and uh, the influence of, uh, of Indian science so great uh, mm. that, uh, that the truth is, is, is every bit as strange, I think, as, as, as any fiction. So, yeah, I, I, sorry. Sorry, no, no, carry on. So, to start at the beginning, um, mm. way back at the time of Ashoka, 250 BC, we get the first versions of the numerals that are used universally now around the world. Maybe we should start there. Yes, I think, I mean, I, I came to this subject because of my interest in, in the science of the medieval period in the Islamic empire, um, uh, where of course that was a place where a lot of these different cultures and, and, and texts were being gathered from different parts of the world. So of course, many came from Greece, from Persia, but of course uh, of, of relevance here from, from, from India. And that's, I mean, I'm, I was aware that what we use today, the numbering system, the decimal system we use today, uh, many people in the West still call it Arabic numerals, but of course we now know correctly is uh, Hindi or Indian numerals or Indian Arabic numerals. I was aware they'd originated from India, but I hadn't really dug into the story of just how far back they go. Because of course they weren't, um, really adopted in the Western world, in Europe, until relatively recently, the last few hundred years. And so that's surprising because actually the decimal system is brilliant. It's, yeah. it, it, it's so convenient. Com compare it with, I don't know, Roman numerals. <laughs> Try and do long division using Roman numerals. It's all... E1111, 1x, 1x. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Whereas the decimal system is, is just so convenient. And, and I was astonished to see how far back it goes. So we're, ta we're talking, you know, over 2000 years ago. So it is quite, quite incredible that the, the idea of counting numbers in decimals up to, you know, tens and twenties and thirties, rather than some other base system is, is absolutely ancient. So there are, in a sense, there are two different things which we're talking about here. One is actually the, the, the shapes of the, yeah. of the numerals, the, the, the one, two, three figures that we have on our keypads in front of us at the moment, anyone that's looking at a computer. Um, and the other thing is, is this idea of place value, one yeah. column for, yeah. for, 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 for units, then tens, then hundreds. Uh, and, and both of those are Indian innovations. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, the certainly the, the you know the, we'll probably talk about things like place value and 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 the role of zero and maybe even negative numbers, um, but yes, the the the, the shape of, of of the the symbols used for the numbers we we we, we are familiar with today certainly go back um, two or more millennia. In in terms of the uh, um, sort of placeholder, uh, the, the idea that. Uh, you know, without a placeholder, if how would we um, define, say, the, our, the year 2020, 2020? You'd say it's a thousand times two plus a hundred times zero plus ten times two, <laughs> which is a very long-winded way of saying it. But placeholders divide up, as you say, the units from the tens, from the hundreds, from the thousands. That probably. I, I may be wrong, but I think it goes back to to the great Indian mathematician Aryabhata. Um, so, Tell me so about is, Aryabhata. He's he's what four four nine nine is the date usually given to him for when when he writes his uh, his, his his tracts. Yes, so roughly yes. what's happening in the West at that time? Rome has fallen. Rome has fallen. That the the uh, the Islamic world hasn't been born yet. Um, so it's it's really the beginning of the Dark Ages in in, in Europe. Um, but in India, we have in, the in beginning India, of the Gupta period. Ab absolutely, absolutely. I, I, um, so you know, Aryabhata, wonderful mathematician. I guess probably certainly from the West's point of view, the the, the, the greatest influence did come from Brahmagupta, um, because it was his text that was translated into Persian and into Arabic and then into Latin. <laughs> um, and, and that's, it was, so for me studying the, the, the Islamic world, it's interesting to see what are the books that they regarded as the must have, you know, these are the books we have to understand. 
of course, you had the, the work of the Greeks, you know, the, you know Galen, uh, his book on, on medicine, you had Aristotle, you had Euclid's book on geometry, and of course, you also have Brahma Gupta's uh, Siddhanta, uh, which in Arabic is called the Sindhind. Um, it, it arrived, so Brahma Gupta is, is what, seventh, seventh century uh, AD or the common era. Um, and we should mention that as he, he, Brahma Gupta comes from Rajasthan. There's a good Rajasthani festival. He's uh, ah, right. uh, near, uh, near Mount Abu. I, I don't know how well known he is in the, re in the, in the rest of the world. Um, but I think, you know, if I were to draw up a league table of the greatest ever thinkers in history, I would put Brahma Gupta up there in the top 10, top 20 in the, in, in the world, in history. He, he was so influential. What's interesting is that when his work was translated into Arabic, it was extremely obscure. Now, I, my understanding is that the Siddhanta, uh, which in Sanskrit, I think, means um, the doctrine or the, the tradition, um, was written entirely in verse. That was, the, that was the, the tradition then. You'd write this whole thing in verse. Memorization, I believe. Mm, that's right. That's exactly right. That you could teach mathematics with these... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, ropes to help with rote learning. <laughs> exactly. And and um, but a lot of the scholars in the Islamic world found it very obscure until they really understood the relevance of it. Uh, there are lots of stories about why they found it obscure. I think there's a story that someone who who tried to explain it to the caliph in Baghdad um, didn't speak Arabic, didn't speak Persian, so you had to have someone translating. <laughs> into Persian and someone tried the version to Arabic. So it's not surprising they found it obscure. But it became one of the texts that if you wanted to understand mathematics, you had to read what they called the Sindhind uh, and, and the number system. And obviously, you know, in the ancient world, there are many traditions of astronomy. There's Greece, there's Babylon, there's ancient Persia. What are the things that are specific to India? What are the Indian contributions that none of the other, that the Greeks didn't have, that the Babylonians didn't have? And the, uh, and the and the Persians. Well, I think the, the there there are lots of examples of early development of, of of mathematical techniques in in astronomy. For example, the the birth of what we call trigonometry today, so sines and cosines and tans, is absolutely crucial in astronomy. And so, what what Indian scholars, people like Brahma Gupta, who was as great an astronomer as he was a mathematician we're doing we're, we're, we're mathematizing astronomy so using uh, mathematical techniques to help them understand and study the, the, uh, the heavens uh, of course this is all before telescopes uh, and so uh, there the, 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 there are there were various instruments that were developed uh, uh, in different parts of the world that got sort of copied elsewhere um, astrolabes, for example, were, were hugely influential in Indian astronomy. What, one of the, the concepts I find most fascinating is that, you know, we think about Copernicus as the great astronomer who said, the earth goes round the sun, not the sun around the earth. So, uh, you know, the ancient Greeks thought the earth was the center of, of, of the universe. Uh, the, the geocentric model, this is as, as um, explained by Ptolemy, the great Alexandrian astronomer. Um, and we say, well, obviously, obviously that's wrong. Uh, but Copernicus comes along in, you know, many, many centuries later and says, no, it's the Earth that goes around the sun. Astronomers in India had already proposed and suggested that, in fact, the Earth goes around the sun. They even suggested the Earth spins on its axis. But that, it, for, for, for a number of reasons, that never really caught on. I, I have a feeling it's because the giants of Indian science, like Brahma Gupta, weren't so keen on the idea that the, the Earth goes around the sun. So other lesser astronomers may have been right, but almost got slapped down by the bigger names. So Brahma Gupta Arya was, was, was like the Greeks. He was geocentric, wasn't it? Aryabhata thought that the, 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 the Earth was the center. That's right, that's yeah. right. Yes, yeah, so, so Brahma Gupta comes along. Because Brahma Gupta was so influential, uh, the, it, that, that idea of, of heliocentrism, um, the sun at the center, didn't really cash on in India, as, as, as happened in, in other parts of the world as well. Even in ancient Greece, there were, there were Greek astronomers who proposed it, uh, that the sun was at the center, and 
that idea just didn't propagate. Sometimes you have to wait when the time is right for the, for the truth to come out. Now, two more ideas that Brahmagupta seems uh, is the first to, um, uh, to, to, to write about, or certainly the oldest surviving text, zero and the idea of negative numbers. Yes, yeah, I, I, I find these wonderful because we, we talk about, you know, what did Indian mathematics give the world while it gave us the decimal system? Well, yeah, that's great, but what we, people don't quite appreciate is the idea of zero and negative numbers. The, the notion of negative numbers, I believe, goes back almost two millennia um, because in, in Indian mathematicians treated the idea of debt as being the mirror image of, of profit, of credit. And, and they associated negative numbers with debt quite naturally. And, and today we think, well, that's quite normal. You know, if you have an overdraft in your bank of, you know, have made 200 pounds or whatever, you know that's minus, that's negative. Um, but the rest of the world didn't catch on to this. They, I, it, it seems that the mathematicians of the rest of the world just weren't clever enough to catch on to negative numbers as quickly as Indian mathematicians did. The, the story of zero is, I think, is even more fascinating because uh, when we talk about zero, we have to be sure we're talking about the right thing because there's zero as a symbol that's, you know, to, as a placeholder to, to, to distinguish between uh, 11 and 101. Um, zero as a symbol goes all the way back to the ancient Babylonians, 300 BCE. So, so that's, that's a very old concept. But just because you can draw a picture of what zero means doesn't mean you understand it as a concept. The notion of zero as, as indicating nothingness, the void, I think yeah. goes as, yeah, 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 it's, it's, yeah exactly. Um, but I think that the idea actually, as far as I'm aware, starts with Aristotle in ancient Greece. So although Sunya, yes, means the void or, or nothingness, the notion of the vacuum, the, 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 the the lack of anything, uh, the void, goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks. But again, that's not a mathematical definition of zero. The idea that zero is a number between negative and positive, between plus one and minus one, that we can trace back to people like Brahma Gupta. Oh, interesting. So Aristotle has the idea of, of nothingness, but he doesn't think it's a number. Yeah, but not, but not a number. But, but the, the idea that you can... Um, uh, you know, uh, multiply a number by zero, uh, and that gives you zero. Uh, that's we do, we learn that at school now, uh, uh, and it's obvious. But it's it not an obvious, obvious concept. Yeah, divide a number by zero, and you get infinity. Again, uh, that's quite an abstract concept. Again, developed and really well understood by Indian mathematicians like Brahmagupta. Um, I've been reading a very interesting new book um, out a couple of years ago by a guy called Michael Willis at the British Museum. Uh, and he's been working on the Gupta sacred site um, uh, at, at, at the heart of the Gupta dominions, where there were um, apparently a great number of astronomical sundials and, 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 and things which you can still see uh, in, mm -hmm. in the rocks in Odegiri. And his, his idea is that in Odegiri, it's, it's arranged um, so you can measure the solstices, that you have the, the sun coming and going. And that this was a, was a Gupta royal sacred site where astronomy was being used in a sense to enhance and legitimize kingship. Uh, the, 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 this was, the, in other words, not only have you got the scientists working in abstractions, this is very practically put to use uh, mm. by mm. kings to, to, uh, to cement their rule. Yeah, I think it's interesting because when astronomy developed in the Islamic world, it was in the service of religion. It would, uh, but and, and again, you can see a practical reason for that. You know, they want to know the uh, the phases of the moon. They want to know the time for prayer, the month of Ramadan for fasting, and so on. So, so it's very much is in the service of religion. The astronomers would live in mosques, and 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 they'd have their sundials there. It's interesting in India that it was seen as a uh, a sign of 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 of, uh, uh, of prestige, uh, t t you know, to to have astronomers working in uh, you know in in uh, for the king uh, to give him advice was was it's a different 
different concept that we didn't see, we don't really see elsewhere. And one concept that does go into this like, world is the whole idea of astrology, which today, in a sense, we, we, dis we dismiss scientifically, but at the time is very closely linked to astronomy. Uh, yes. The idea that you can predict the future by studying the heavens is, is very, very strong. Yeah, uh, you know, to, as you say, today we know astronomy is a science. It helps us understand the nature of, of the cosmos. Uh, and, you know, we know so much now. But uh, astrology now is a bit of fun. It's not, you know, it, 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 don't take it seriously. We, we know now the forces that govern the universe. And we know that distant stars and planets can't control what happens for us here on earth but there yes be people but, who would dispute that here but uh, we, but we, we, we which is why i'm saying it. i just want to start an argument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah come on then Astro <laughs> astrology <laughs> nonsense <laughs> um but yeah i mean but back in in you know in in uh, uh, the early um period of of, of the indian uh, scholarship and, and indeed in the rest of the world, there wasn't a distinction between astronomy and astrology there were a few scholars around the world who who tried to make a divide in this in the same way that they tried to divide between chemistry and alchemy. You know, right. one's a science and the other is is is, is based on sort of it's more sort of spiritual or, or, or based on other belief systems. But you can see the the reason why astronomers were also keen on coming up with astrological charts and predictions for their leaders, for their kings. Because, you know, the, the king wants to know when is the best time to go to war or, uh, or, or you know, what, what are the star signs that, you know, needed for when to plant your, your, your crop. Uh, and so astrology sort of is, was, is so embedded as a part of the culture that you can see it has a use culturally, if not scientifically. So you mentioned the Islamic world. And, and so let's take the story on on the next the next leg of the journey westward. So in 711, you have uh, Muhammad al-Qasim conquering Sindh and yeah. Islam reaching what's now, I suppose, Karachi, um, yeah. as, far as, yeah. uh, as far as modern Pakistan. Um, and very soon after that, you get uh, Indian sadhus making their way into the heart of the Arab world. You have Indian embassies bringing the books of Brahma Gupta and the learning of Indian astronomy and, astro and mathematics to Baghdad. Talk, talk a little about that. So Baghdad has just been founded, Caliph al-Mansur is on the throne. What's the intellectual world there which the Indians are coming into? Baghdad, once it was, uh, very, very quickly, once it was uh, built and designated as, as, the, as the capital of this new, um, as you say, rapidly expanding vast um, Islamic empire, they've got as far as uh, uh, say Karachi in, in the east, they got as far as Spain in the west, um, but Baghdad really was the center, it was the place to be. Part of the, you know, the ruling uh, um, uh, family, the, the, the Caliphs or the, Ab the Abbasids, um, were very keen on scholarship. They, they, for them, the idea of getting books and translating them from, from Greek, from, from uh, Persian, from Pahlavi, from Sanskrit, all into Arabic, became an obsession. So scholarship and learning was, was the thing to do. It was fashionable. And that meant that Baghdad became the place, if you wanted to go and, and, and uh, uh, work whether you're a musician, a theologian, an astronomer, a mathematician, a medic, Baghdad was the place you could go where, where you could receive funding. <laughs> you, you, could, you could earn a living be, being a scholar. And, 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 and so people are, from all around the world. You know, in a sense, collating all the different learning, bo bodies of learning from all the different cultures of the ancient world. Roman, Hellenic, yeah. Babylonian, Persian, and particularly in terms of astronomy and mathematics, the learning of India. India. Yeah, it was, the, it was the first time in history that you had a bringing together, a synthesis of all these different cultures and ideas. You would have had, you know, when, when Alexander the Great traveled, you know, would have been some exchange between Indian and Greek scholarship. India and Persia, uh, you know, would have overlapped and exchanged and translated from Pahlavi to Sanskrit and, and back and forth. But in the Islamic world, and in Baghdad in particular, and the famous House of Wisdom, this is the first time, as you say, we see all these different ideas 
coming from all around the world and all being synthesized and translated into one language, into Arabic, because of course that was the, the language of the Quran and so the language of the, the, the official language of the empire. So anyone who wanted to make a name for themselves in, in their field, whatever it was, really had to travel to places like Baghdad and write their text in Arabic, which is the reason why very often we talk about that as the golden age of Arabic science, even though they weren't all Arabs, of course. And one of the people who weren't Arabs were the, the, the Barmakids, the, the vizier's mm -hmm. family, who I think were from Balk, which is mo in modern Afghanistan. And these guys were the yeah. hereditary Buddhist abbots of the big Buddhist monastery in Balk. So again, of Indic culture. They came from a world um, Buddhist. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and hugely influential in, in, the, in uh, the, the, the Abbasid, you know, high, higher echelons of, of power. Uh, many of these Burmakis became the viziers, the advisors to, to the caliph himself. Including they were all... Gaffer, who's the, uh, the, the in, in the Disney version, is the, is the villain of the 101 Nights. He's the villain. In, 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 in reality, he wasn't actually. The, 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 the character himself, the, the caliph's advisor, wasn't a villain. He was a very learned and scholared person who, you know, who, who, who really sort of... Uh, uh, supported a lot of scholarship and a lot of translations. Um, Disney, has, Disney has libeled the, this guy, as well as mispronouncing him as Jafar. <laughs> Jafar, <laughs> yes. Jafar as opposed to Jafar. Yeah. <laughs> so at this point, you've got now Indian star tables, astronomy, trigonometry, prediction of eclipses, and algebra, all making mm. their way into this great stew of learning in Baghdad. Yes, who are the yes. who are characters who are overseeing this? I'm thinking, you know, Al Khwarizmi. Is he, is Al Khwarizmi he... and uh, Al Kindi. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, I think that uh, there are an, a number of names. There are people who are sort of uh, rather more obscure. Uh, for example, it's, it's argued the first person to translate Brahma Gupta's uh, Siddhanta into Arabic was a was an astrologer by the name of Al Fazari. In, in uh, Mansour's... Um, uh, one of the inventors of the astrolabe, isn't he? Fazari? One of the inventors, absolutely, yes. I think sometimes in history there, it's quite, there, there are a number of Al-Fazaris, but I think this, this one, very early on in the, in the 8th century, uh, an advisor to Al-Mansour, the, the, the first caliph uh, of the Abbasid period, um, he translated the, the, the Ramagupta's work into Arabic. But he wasn't as influential as some of the scholars that came a little bit later in the early ninth century. And then the two in particular who are household names, probably in most cultures around the world, there's Al-Kindi, uh, the great uh, philosopher of the Arabs, he's an um, Arab working in Baghdad, and, and probably even an even better known name, Khawarizmi, the, the Persian uh, mathematician. So they were both- After whom we get the word algorithm. Algorithm, which is the, the Latinized version, uh, 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 after the Latinized version of his name, Algorithmus. And also he wrote the very first book on, on what we would today call algebra uh, because of the, the title of his book, Al Jabr, Kitab Al Jabr, the book of completion, um, was regarded as the very first text on just doing algebra correctly. But for our story, I think what that was of most relevance for, for, uh, when it comes to Beth Al Kindi and Khwarizmi is that they introduced the uh, Indian uh, decimal system to the Arab world. They wrote books about it. They talked about how convenient it was and how useful it was. What's interesting is that it took a long time for the rest of the West to cotton on to this idea, just how useful these numbers are. One point I think that's probably important to make here is that one sees a lot on, in, in the kind of right-wing internet that the Arabs appropriate Indian learning, that they steal Indian learning. One thing I was very struck with reading about this recently is how much they acknowledge Indian, the Indian origin of their, their studies. They very much, I mean, al yeah. title is the book of Hindu calculation. He actually, in the yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, and even today, the the, uh, the yes. Yeah, so, so I think uh, Al Kindi also wrote a book on Indian numerals, Kitab fi Istimal al Adad al Hindi, the book for the use of Indian numbers. Yeah. So certainly then, and even today, when in the Arab world, when you talk about what 
in the West, in English, many will say Arabic numerals. In Arabic, they're called Indian numerals. So it's very much an acknowledgement that they, that they are not pretending that they invented them, or if they do, they're ignorant of the true origins of these numbers. So we've got about five minutes to questions. And so let's fast forward. How does this system, so it's invented, decimal system and, this, and these numbers, invented in India, the symbols of these numbers are there from the time of Ashoka. They make it to Baghdad by the 8th, 9th century. How do they end up in, in Europe? Maybe we could talk about Fibonacci. Yes, um, so Fibonacci is an, uh, uh, one of a number of Europeans in the 11th, 12th, 13th century who realized that if they wanted to find out all the clever stuff, or, you know, the scholarship in mathematics and astronomy and, 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 and so many other areas, they weren't going to find it in Europe. Europe was still in the dark ages, uh, there were pockets of scholarship here and there of people trying to sort of hold out against the, the ignorance and the superstition uh, in Europe. And many of those scholars knew they had to travel to the Islamic world to initially to actually to, to retrieve the, the, the great Greek texts. So they were aware of the, ancient, the work of the ancient Greeks, um, Aristotle and Euclid and, and, and Ptolemy and, and, and Galen and so on. Um, what they did when they got to the to, to places like Baghdad and and in Spain, Cordoba and Granada, Toledo, and, and Toledo, exactly. The, the, so so there were these centres which became a focus of translation, a translation movement from Arabic into Latin. And amongst these Arabic texts were original books written in Arabic, but also Sanskrit texts from India that had been translated into Arabic. So you see these texts, they, they sort of hop from one language to another. And people like Fibonacci, um, uh, the great Italian uh, mathematician, discovered the work of Khawarizmi. So he discovered algebra, and at the same time discovered this wonderful numbering system, the decimal system. So he takes it and, and tries to disseminate it in, uh, throughout Europe. And, he, and Fibonacci's father is running a, a, a Pisan trading outpost in what's yeah. now Algeria. And he grows yes, up yeah. Arab, so he learning up Arabic. He, so he learns to speak Arabic. So that's the crucial thing. He's able to, to read the, the text of people like Khwarizmi in the original Arabic. And, and uh, I think he refers to Khwarizmi as Mehmet, uh, based, based after Khwarizmi's first name, Muhammad. Uh, and, and so he, he can translate quite, you know, um, skillfully these Arabic texts in, into Latin. As a, as a patriotic Scot, I should mention here the role of Michael Scott, who was, I was brought up with tales of him being a wizard uh, in the borders. But uh, in reality, he was the head of the court of Frederick II, who was the king of Sicily and much of Italy and, and the Holy Roman Empire. And he mm. brings Fibonacci from uh, uh, into the center of his court and disseminates all this stuff out. So we have a, we have a Scot, and then Adelard of Bath, an English Adelard one. of Bath, yes, yes. Tell, tell us about him, what's Adelard of Bath up to? Oh, I, do you know, I, I, I'm trying, there are, there are a number of these characters, Adelard of Bath, um, Gerard of Cremona, Robert of Chester, um, and. Uh, these are also medieval scholars who essentially worked almost in isolation. So unlike the scholars of Baghdad, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the ninth century in the House of Wisdom, where you're surrounded by other, other thinkers, or you go to, you know, Alexandria and the Library of Alexandria and some of the, the wonderful work of the Greeks. A lot of these uh, scholars in, in, in Western Europe were working very much in isolation. And, and so in a sense, I feel we need to give them even more credit that they're able to find out where in the world these wonderful texts are and to try and, 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 and disseminate them, uh, you know, within their own culture. It must have been incredibly difficult. Ockham, William of Ockham is another, right. an, another one. <laughs> so just to, to, in a sense, bring this in to, to its final resting place. So we, we started in India, we've moved to Baghdad, Fibonacci sitting in, um, uh, in Algeria and uh, uh, Gerard of Cremona sitting in Toledo are bringing these ideas now in, into Europe. The first universities are opening in, uh, on the edge of the Islamic world in Paris and Bologna, Salerno. 
uh, mm. picking up this idea of, of, of a university from, from the Islamic world. And how far can you say that the, the decimal system and the advances in mathematics that take place in, uh, in Italy, having got this new technology in a sense, um, then in a sense powers the Renaissance because it's, it's Italian banking and Italian money lending and mm. calculation which then you know, moves the whole Western Europe into the Renaissance. Can, can, we, can, we, can, it, can India take distant credit for some of this? Absolutely. I mean, I, the science and, and learning uh, and, uh, and scholarship and a lot of particularly in, in areas like mathematics, you, you, you cannot start from scratch. Everything is built on foundations that came before. The, the Renaissance in Europe and the scientific revolution wouldn't have happened without, certainly without, you know, the work of the Greeks or the, 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 the work of the, in, in the Islamic empire and the math, mathematicians of India, the mathematicians and astronomers of India, when they were de developing the decimal system, the Platonic system, zero, negative numbers, how to work out square roots, the mathematics that we just use today and take for granted wouldn't have happened without these great thinkers uh, just a few hundred years you know it's about 1500 years ago so it's absolutely vital where we, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to, to some of these mathematicians without whom well i don't know maybe we'd have found it from somewhere else but uh, it certainly helped kickstart the renaissance absolutely wonderful fantastic so we've got about 10 minutes left i think for questions and and they're pouring in and the great uh, streams of them coming um on on this feed i've got in front of me um so uh subhadeep majumdar asks how do you think the invention of numbers and digits influenced literature in ancient history has aryabhata mentioned about relativity of motion um it's it's difficult to to, to tie uh, the influence of numbers to to to, uh, to other ideas outside of mathematics. Somebody um, else was asking about uh, the link between numbers and music. Another interesting field. Is that well, yeah, well, I, that that's certainly very clear. In fact, you know, back at the time of people like Arivata and Brahmagupta, um, music was a branch of mathematics. <laughs> it was, you know, you, you you had arithmetic, you had geometry. Uh, and and you had um, and you had music, and so so much of music uh, is mathematical. You know, we understand that we th listen to work. Um, Indian complicated by... Indian tals. Right, so, absolutely. Uh, and uh, and and I think again, Al Kindi, the the Arab uh, Arabic um, philosopher, wrote a lot about music, and he understood some of the, the 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 differences culturally in music coming from different parts of the world. Many other questions. Um, uh, Pinak asks, engineering in Arabic is called Hindisa. Presumably Hind refers to India. Uh, I was talking to a, to a friend some years ago, uh, and he says it's obscure where, where the, the, the Hindisa, uh, yes, engineering actually comes from. I'm not sure. I, you know, I, it, it's, it the may word. be one of those occasions where we try it, you know, where one can try and lay claim and say, well, it, it, that originates from India. The, the etymology of that word, Hendasa, isn't clear to me. I'm sure it may be well known to, to, to others, but I'm, I'm afraid I can't say for sure. Interesting question from Sudhir Tandon. He says, did Indian architecture and spatial design influence the Arab world? Um, it, it did via Persia. Um, a lot of the, the um, in, in the early Islamic uh, um, period, in the Abbasid period, the Abbasids were, were, were in love with Persian culture. <laughs> they, they, you know, for them, anything Persian was good, was great. And so they were, uh, they were very influenced by Persian uh, literature, Persian architecture, and Persia and, and, and India, before the Islamic world, there was a lot of overlap between them. So in terms of designing uh, temples and, and, and palaces and so on, I, I would imagine a lot of that influence would have just sort of passed from east to west over the course of a number There's, of centuries. I believe there are some references at the time of Alexander the Great to the libraries of the ancient Persians containing Indian words. Um, well, that, yeah, so that goes back a very long time, absolutely, yes. You yes. have the idea of Indian diffusion of Indian ideas 
already by the time of Alexander the Great in what 300 BC. Yes, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. You, you, it's really difficult to to draw lines and separate. You know, what is Indian influence? What is Persian influence? What is European influence? These ideas cross fertilize and disseminate across. Alexander the Great is a very good example of 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 how cultural ideas can transfer from very different distant parts of the world you you can't just say this is this came from this part of the world or that came from that part of the world ideas and ideologies are always being exchanged you you would you would know far better than me as an as a historian <laughs> what do i know i'm a physicist <laughs> interesting question from renita um she said how did the certainty of maths and science evolve as it went from east to west in regard to religion. In other words, in a sense that the battle between science and uh, uh, and uh, religious ideas. Um, I can really only say what I know about what happened in the in the Islamic world, um, and there was certainly an uh, an acknowledgement that a, a rational picture of the world, uh, whether mathematically or whether just by observation, carrying out experiments, what we would call science today, so it went hand in hand very comfortably with ideas from religion in, in a way that sometimes one feels quite frustrated these days when they're somehow science and religion are put up in conflict with each other, that somehow that there's a battle between them or a friction. But certainly in the in the early um, Abbasid period, for example, you know, even though you know it, everything is driven by by the, this new religion, there was an understanding among the scholars that you know God's given me a brain, uh, I better go and use it and, and and find out about the world rationally instead of making stuff up. Um, so, and I think that would have been the same among any of the great cultures uh, in, in history, including certainly the golden age during the time of Aryabhata and Brahmagupta. Interesting question here from Sachdev Ramakrishna, who asks, could you comment on the work of Fazari and his use of Indian mathematical texts? Um, if it's the Fazari who, 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 who is credited with, uh, with the first astrolabe in this- That Fazari, yeah. Um, not so much is known about him, and I think part, part of the problem is that, as I mentioned earlier, there are a number of scholars in the Islamic world, in, in Arabs and Persians, by the name of Al-Fazari. Um, he, he certainly uh, was a, an astrologer at, at, at the time, um, and Mansour surrounded himself with a number of very influential astrologers. Al-Fazari was one of them, but he was also uh, well-versed in mathematics, uh, well versed in, in 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 many languages, uh, and so certainly credited with the first translation. A lot of these texts from 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 Sanskrit, translated into Arabic, underwent a number of cycles, a number of editions, the same as the, the, the works of the Greeks translated into Arabic. Uh, and so there may have been other more uh, more more accurate, more 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 careful translations, but certainly Al Fazari. Um, had studied the work of Brahmagupta and is regarded as the first person to translate Brahmagupta. That, that's what he's known for best of all, I think, in history, to, to have brought Brahmagupta's work to the Islamic world. Well, one question for, I'd, I'd like to ask is how far are Fazari and Al Khwarizmi inventing new mathematical ideas and how far are they merely transmitting Indian ones? Um, it, it's certainly true. Al Fazari, I would say, is is isn't the original mathematician that Al Khwarizmi uh, was. Uh, Khwarizmi, I think, there is no doubt that on the one hand, yes, he's translate uh, transmitting the the, the Indian uh, decimal system. Yes, so he's he he sees it. He, he he sees the usefulness of the decimal system that's coming from India and says, you know, why aren't we all using this? And he translates the work into Arabic and writes about it and tell, tells the world how useful it is. But in terms of his textbook on algebra, Khwarizmi really is uh, an original thinker. He's although people are, are trying to do some basic algebra before that, going all the way back to the ancient Greeks, even the Babylonians were doing a bit of what we call solving quadratic equations. Khwarizmi is the first person to really develop algebra as an independent field of mathematics. It's not number theory, it's using symbols 
manipulating symbols according to certain rules that he generalizes that, you know, X equals, you know, Y plus X equals three, you know, the stuff that we learn at school now goes back as far as higher as me. And really before him, it wasn't really algebra. I've, so he is a if great I remember correctly, I read somewhere that sign, um, the sign function was invented in India, but the cos and tan were Arabic additions. Yes, the, 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 the sign, uh, I wish I could remember the details of the story of the, the etymology of the word sign, but it comes from um, uh, the, the arc of a circle or, uh, and the cord, right. the, cord, the bow of an arrow, you know, the bow of a, um, uh, the cord of a bow of an arrow. And there's a, there's a, a number of steps or translations from the, from the Sanskrit until you get to sign. The word we use now, sign, it comes from the, uh, Latin sinus, uh, uh, which means pocket, I think. Um, a, a, a translator from Arabic into Latin mistranslated the Arabic <laughs> um, because the Arabic was using the, the, the Sanskrit original. So there's all this, you see this again and again, confusion of translations from one language to another. Uh, but yes, sign comes from word India. Zero, it's Sunya in... Sanskrit becomes, uh, what is it, what's the Arabic? Uh, Sunya becomes Sifr. Sifr, and then that becomes the English cipher. It becomes English cipher, yes. And, and it, it then the, the, the Latinized version of Sifr becomes Zephyrum, uh, and from Zephyrum you get zero. Uh, and so, yes, again, all these, you know, multiple steps, but, but the zero that we use today can be traced back to Sunya in, in Sanskrit. I think, Jim, we are, we are very close to the end. Um, so do you, do you want to make one last sort of summing up? What, what, if you had to put it in, in, in a short um, uh, sentence, what, what do we owe? What, what is the gift of Indian mathematics to the world? Without Indian mathematics, I think, well, we, we may have developed the modern world, but I think the modern world that we have today with the decimal system, that we take so for granted and the technologies that have changed our world can essentially be traced back to this technique that the rest of the world took hundreds of years to, to realize how useful it was. Because in the West, they were just using letters instead of numbers. And they didn't realize how useful and how brilliant the, the Indian numbering system was. Uh, it, it, eventually they picked it up. But I think a huge debt of gratitude and, and, and thanks to some of these wonderful characters from history that certainly in, outside of India deserve to be far, far better known. Jim Alkhidi, thank you so very, very much. That's very kind. My pleasure. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, William. That was just fascinating. And we still have questions streaming in. So if you don't mind, we'll send some of them to you. And if you can answer some of them, we'll then post them back on to uh, Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. And like I said, I'm really sorry. It was such a fascinating conversation, but we couldn't take all your questions. We thank our official radio partners, Red FM, Bajati Raho. Please do remember to log in at 9 p.m. for our next session, The Age of Anxiety, Casey Schwartz and Amrita Tripathi in conversation.